Welcome to episode 32 of the House of Jordans podcast, a sports hobby culture production. I'm Christina, and you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Christina's PC, K R I S T I N A S P C. And I'm here with Chris. You can find me on Instagram at Chris underscore H O J. You can find me on Twitter at House of Jordans, and you can find all of us on YouTube at House of Jordans. And shout out to Nick, aka Stiff Arm Wax, on all the social media platforms, the video producer of this show. And I'm here with Brian. You can find me on Instagram at Joding Cards, J O E D I N Cards. So here's a really quick show preview. We're going to have some quick thoughts on Project 2020 after two months of Project 2020. Then we're going to have Christina's Corner recap and reactions. Then we're going to do the last dance market analysis at long last part deuce and then finally we will do mail days that means two so yeah i didn't know before we get into the substance of the show we have a quick announcement that announcement is there is a new house of jordan's spinoff podcast tell us more christopher called conversations with chris is something everybody has desperately wanted and we're finally giving it to them i've launched a new podcast series available only on the house of jordan's youtube channel called conversations with chris the theme of the show is very simple stop laughing at me (laughs) i talk to card collectors with interesting points of view or specialized knowledge if there's someone out there who can bring value to you guys our audience i want to talk to them my first episode came out this week i talked to anthony aka summertime cards on instagram he is a professional sports better He's now heavily involved with cards. He's got a lot of great knowledge about the NBA. And he has some interesting takes on the league and the sports card market. We talked about which players he's buying as we prepare for the NBA to resume at the end of July. We talked about which players he thinks are overvalued, which players we think are undervalued, and some of the fun stories of some of the crazy wagers that he has made over the course of his professional sports betting career. You can hear this episode at the House of Jordan's YouTube channel. And we are also releasing... As you should know by now, two Christina's Corner episodes per week. And we are not done adding new content to the House of Jordan's channel. It's a sneak peek teaser alert there. So stay tuned. All right. First topic. Quick hobby topic. Project 2020 after two months. So Aaron at Slap Socks came out with a post analyzing the market for the Ermsey Trout. And basically, the graph that he constructed showed the car's trajectory over the month of May. It started in May at about $250 to $300. It surged all the way up to $2,500 in late May. And then now recently, it has dropped all the way down to $1,000. So why are we talking about this? Well, Project 2020 has become one of the most interesting and polarizing topics in the hobby, and I want to give my take on it since everybody's given their take. Let me give mine. Each of the 2,911 copies of the Ermsey Trout was originally purchased for $20 or less only two months ago, and they're now selling for roughly $1,000 each. I've studied historical price trajectories for thousands of cards over the years. I cannot name another card that did a 50x in two months. Now, taking into consideration when we analyze the two important investment variables, one is the absolute dollar gain. Here, that's $980. And the other is how long did it take the time elapsed? And here we're talking two months. The Ermsey Trout currently is unequivocally The GOAT card from the ROI point of view, and if it is surpassed, which it is, it is only by other Project 2020 cards like the Ben Baller Ichiro. What makes this even more intriguing, and I have to tip my hat, is that outside of Christina's PC, (laughs) the Sports Card Nation podcast, Slab Stocks, and a very few, if any, other hobby content creators have discussed Project 2020 outside of you guys. I'm sure there's some, but I'm not aware of them. And I listen to a lot of hobby content. And those few outside of the ones that I mentioned who did discuss it, a lot of times it was just to criticize it or to you know mock it. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I just love Project 2020. It is an underdog story. And we love those. It's a demonstration that fidelity to the collector point of view can prove incredibly profitable. And it's an inspiration to hobbyists to always stay alert for the next hobby movement. So, Christina and then Brian, do you have any thoughts two months in on Project 2020? 
I think everyone knows my thoughts by this point about Project 2020. Um, it's not easy to keep waxing poetic about the intersection of art and cards in the way that Tops did this. Um, and yet, I keep going. Um, I've had three artists now um, on Christina's Corner. And like, stay tuned because you might just be getting some, a few more in the coming months. But um, I think it's a great concept. I love the implementation. I really enjoyed the cards in their digital form. And then as Chris has pointed out, um, once you had them in hand, they looked even now, better. Did anybody steer you to this card? Did anybody say, look, this is going to be a great investment opportunity? No, I had um, a few listeners of House of Jordans. I tip my hat to you. I don't recall who was off the top of my head, and I'm so sorry, um, who asked me my thoughts in DMs about this project. Because they know that you like art and cards. Yes, and I hadn't heard of it before then, so I was like, Wow, like I think I had two people on Instagram and one person on Twitter who reached out to me and was like, what do you know about this? What do you think about this? Like, I'm thinking about buying some. And I was like, this is really interesting. Let me do some research. And then I was like, I definitely am talking about this in episode 26 on Christina's Corner segment. And... I'm going to surprise Christopher and I'm going to buy a few before. <laughs> well, that's I something that's really it. fun about this. It ha- it feels very organic. It feels very grassroots and it feels very collector driven. And that is something that's uh, a little bit unusual about it. And it makes it a fascinating case study. And it's something worth looking at more closely and taking um, a holistic approach to looking at the market for these cards. Brian, what are your thoughts on Project 2020 at this point in time, two months out? I mean, I think it's great. Um, I really just like the artistic part about, you know, how it brings in the artist and cards and just makes, it just makes dope cards. Like these artists are just making amazing cards and it's really cool to see. Um, And even coming from the standpoint of like, I'm not necessarily a baseball collector, you know, I know you guys asked me this question before, like, would you get one? I'm like, I wish I would have gotten one already, but like, I'd be down to like get one for like 20 bucks you know like well there's always a new chance that's the thing so like two a day every week a day I, that's the thing so like to me i i'm willing even if there's a hundred thousand copies of the card i'm willing to pay 20 bucks for it and like that to me is just about like the card collecting aspect like it's not about the money or anything it's just about that you know the cost of 20 dollars is nothing and like the fact that people are making a lot of money on this is like great like from the standpoint of uh, you know, if you're buying the cards or like, I know some artists now are, um, getting some like revenue in from it as well. So, um, I think from that standpoint, it's like good for both collectors and artists and content creators. So, all right, well, we'll keep tabs on project 2020 as it develops. Uh, but two months out, there's a snapshot of our thoughts on it. All right. Segment number two, Christina's Corner recap and reactions. This week, we're going to react to, to Christina's interview with Mitch and Ty, owners of the Bullpen Card Shop in Los Angeles, and recap some of the other Christina's Corners very briefly as well. So, Christina, please take it away. Well, before we get to Mitch and Ty's episode, which was episode number eight, let's talk about episode number seven right quick. We had F. Dot, a.k.a. Eric, who is an artist of the Tops Project 2020 set. Uh, we talked about card art, mural art, and Eric's Patreon, where hobbyists, like Brian was saying, some revenue for artists, hobbyists uh, on this Patreon can have direct input on his upcoming cards for Project that's, 2020. That's pretty Which cool. is really cool. You can, yeah. uh, he said that there's about 200 people in there right now, and like it's all, it's all conversation based. Um, they get shown. Uh, early sketches of the work and then they get to comment on which of the sketches they like better what aspects of a player they should really focus on if they're known for something that a collector would like to see uh mirrored in the card so that's really cool and then we had episode eight which uh was released this week and i sat down with mitch and ty from my lcs the bullpen in los angeles and mitch dropped some heat 
uh, when discussing today's hobby market compared to the 2008 recession and going back all the way back to the late 80s, um, his diagnosis was that the hobby is in an unprecedented moment. Thanks, Mitch. <laughs> in his estimation, he believes that the market will continue to grow for at least two to three years. So I thought that was pretty interesting. If you want to know the rest of Mitch's hot takes, definitely go check out Christina's Corner. Ty then explained that new collectors should try to educate themselves more before diving too deep into the hobby. And she warned that perhaps collectors should be a little more selective as to who they listen to when making hobby purchases. Uh, a comment that we have said before on this show and we've heard from others on episodes of Christina's Corner or conversations with Chris is that you should collect what you like, not what people tell you you should collect. Uh, I highly recommend watching the hour-long interview with Mitch and Ty. There were some hot takes, like I said, great insights and information you probably haven't heard elsewhere from longtime pillars in the hobby community. Uh, it was also an entertaining show throughout. <laughs> Sprinkled through the show was one of Mitch and Ty's favorite pastimes, trolling me. So you have that to look forward to. And then episode nine, I had a conversation with Kevin, uh, also known on Instagram as at underscore oh knows. Kevin has been making amazing athlete portraits for years. And this year he begun his own basketball project 2020 set. And a, a card <laughs> has recently this week been reposted to Panini's story by Kevin um, so I'm choosing to read this as a good sign for me and my fellow Project 2020 enthusiasts who also collect basketball. Next week, I sit down with... You thought I was done. Next week, I sit down with an industry legend, and I cannot wait to share this conversation with you all. I'm going to say is Mount Rushmore. Yes. Mount Rushmore. <laughs> You're going to not know how I got this. That's how, how I'm going to say. <laughs> um, and I also got to know half of an incredible hobby content duo who have brought collectors hours of joy. So don't forget to watch Christina's Corner on the YouTube channel of House and Jordans. Uh, twice a week, guys. Twice a week. There's and me. the original spinoff of House of Jordans. Yeah. <laughs> there's not much to react there um the one thing i find interesting was mitch's comment that he thinks the hobby will continue to be robust for kind of like at least two to three years is kind of the hedge that i hear a lot of people make and i yeah. think that's an abundance of caution that characterizes collecting in general i think collectors in general philosophically are a relatively conservative financially conservative group which is kind of crazy to think about when you sort of see the way the market has looked lately but you can see it in other expressions like like when people especially hobby shop owners like are cautious and they say we're going to see maybe 2 to 3 years of continued growth and then i don't know that's that's an abundance of caution and in being careful and not wanting to sell people anything that they can't themselves necessarily foresee coming to fruition. But it is a very interesting question to analyze since, you know, it, it, that's what we do is we on this show is we just kind of try to, you know, bring a perspective to a topic like this. And what do you guys think if you have thoughts on this? Two to three years out, is that the window of hobby prosperity? Is it shorter? Is it longer? Is there any think, way to know? I think Brian's going to go first. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. I mean, I think that, like, in general, you have to think about the new rookies that are coming into the NBA, and you have to think about, from that standpoint, at least for the for, for the basketball hobby, um, I see a lot of uh, fans in the NBA because a lot of people are becoming fans of these new rookies. So I don't think necessarily two to three years it's going to like die out or anything. Um, I think we have a good class right now that's going to carry the hobby for a while. And then like what happens when that maybe fades out a little bit? I'm not sure. Or how long does that last? I don't know. I mean, how how long do people, you know, how long do career tra trajectories last? You know, there's... There's a lot of time ahead of us, but I would agree with two to three, and I think it's caution. It's cautious, but like we've had people like Gary V say three to five, right? Why does he say three to five though? I don't know. Yeah, I, I but I do agree with the sense of like 
I think the next five year window for the hobby is optimistic. I think we've seen some unprecedented growth in the hobby, but at the same time, there's still room for the hobby to grow. Yeah, well, here's a topic that doesn't um, but, get discussed a lot. Mm-hmm. Sports have grown in terms of revenue, in terms of global importance. I mean, society, culture. Absolutely. People have, have tracked, economists have tracked the growth of sports over time. And that parallels, maybe not proportionally, but it parallels what we've seen in the hobby. Now, the hobby has had a growth rate over the last five to 10 years that outpaces the growth of sports over that period. But maybe that's just because the hobby is sort of catching up to the growth that sports has been experiencing going back to the 90s, whereas the hobby had a valley and then sort of had a resurgence when people of our age began returning to the hobby spontaneously, organically, seemingly kind of all at the same time. And so, you know, I I think um, it the sports writ large, the performance of sports writ large, is going to be a big part of that equation. Is like, will sports continue to ascend and become more culturally important and more prominent? I mean, we like I'm going back a couple episodes, like like 20 episodes now, but we once had a segment uh, where we sort of riffed on how sports and participation with sports has become a common language that people use to interact with each other, whether at the whether they're at the water cooler at work, whether it's fathers and sons, fathers and daughters. This is a topic that people use to relate to each other and connect to. And when sports dialogue takes on that type of currency, that it's like actually sort of the foundation of bonds and shared interests that people can have with each other. Now it's taken on a cultural significance and it's become sort of foundational or institutionalized in a way that will be difficult to tear down. Um, and, and it, it will be it will be painful to try and find new topics and new common interests to replace it. And it wasn't always this way. Sports were not it, this. It's it feels like sports have always been this, but they haven't. There were it, 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 even going back a hundred years, sports was not this important or this prominent. Sports continues to become more focal, more central to our society and our culture, and it and continues to be something that we all can sort of connect with each other about. So as long as that trend continues, I don't see any reason for that trend to stop necessarily. Maybe you worry about the league losing some star power when LeBron leaves or something like that. These are open questions. But generally, that's my answer is that I think you can generally look at sports and cards are are probably going to sort of hang on to the, the coattails of sports as they continue to ascend. Are you done? Yes. Is it my turn now? Maybe. I just want to say, building off of Brian's, um, how do you prospect beyond three years? It's hard right? in like, any industry. I well, mean, really, especially anything, in sports, know? because right now, like prospecting for three years, like yeah, you have the minors, so like potentially, like you could prospect in baseball for three years and beyond three years, but it's not like kids aren't playing sports today. Like high schools, well. <laughs> They're not, but like we'll get over this Corona eventually and people will go back to sports. And yes, I'm worried about the next year's class because we didn't have the NCAA. So like, what does that look like? Will people be like, quote, quote, hot on a prospect for basketball when they haven't been able to see them perform in NCAA? I don't know. But my feeling was before March, no one was really like that hot on certain players for this next class anyway, but we just had two amazing draft classes. We have people in basketball who are just starting to get their legs and become MVPs and superstars in their own right. Like we have a lot of talent in basketball that I think that like you both said, two to three years is very conservative and it's playing it safe. To me, I don't see people taking their money out of the hobby. So unless like a recession hits that's worse than 2008, knock on wood, um, like w- we're going to continue to see people spending money in the hobby and we're going to continue to see people like Mitch said in one of the uh, times in uh, Christina's Corner, like people will be going backwards to 
2016, 17, 2018, 2019, like they'll be going back to look for those boxes. Those cards, like Michael Jordan cards, will always be worth money. And for that, I don't think you go backwards. But that's just me. Well, um, so, so the flip side of the coin is that like when you do talk about draft classes and stuff, you do worry a little bit about if prospects don't pan out and a couple years go by and people start to lose money, um, you know, because eventually somebody does pay that highest price for a player. And maybe you can have a, a system where like you have like um, favorable cascading effects where like somebody pays a thousand and that's the all time high for prospect a who doesn't pan out, but then he's able to sell it within three months to person to the next guy in line who pays 800 and the next guy in line pays 600 and then you sort of like minimize the gain the the losses whereas the nightmare scenario is you have people who just go all in on a prospect sit on their cards the prospect doesn't pan out and then they just get burned massively and that's that's the worry like someone like does like what we did with luca and bite your tongue sir (laughs) bite your tongue sir and the prospect do not even put those words out into the universe may like saint anthony protect that boy and his knees like don't even joke (laughs) okay so that's that's the other side of the coins it's something that i hear talked about in the hobby it does make sense is like people worry like if if people start getting really this though okay like yeah we won't use that person as an actual example We put in a lot of money on player X. Something happens to player X and we lose money or like we lose money. And like, would you stop collecting? No, but we have the fallback of Michael Jordan um, as the foundation to our collection. So I think that the hobby is a little more addicting than you're giving it credit for. I it mean, is. It's I, also I, a community. I I think like you have to think about um more like fan base. You know like cuz like collectors, a lot of collectors are fans of the players and they're not necessarily in it for anything beyond that. Like that's the reason why every player has collectors that buy their cards and things like that. So I think at the end of the day like yes, there is a potential for like somebody to fall off hard, like a prospect, but like you know, does that change how you approach the hobby? Maybe, you know, if that starts to happen, then like we could see some, you know, changes in the hobby and the way that people, uh, you know, place their money and things like that. But I think at the same time, there's just so much upside too to other new prospects that you could just, you know, go into. So I think right now, to your point, Chris, earlier about the culture kind of thing, we're experiencing the lack of sports and like what that means to like community and like everybody. So I think in that sense, it is so tied to our culture that it is like a new necessity that we need. And like, we don't have it. We feel like something's missing. And like, that's, that's something that's different. I think like kind of what you're pointing on in terms of like what sports are today to people and everything like that. So I don't know. Well said. Okay. Uh, interesting discussion. Segment three, the next segment of the show, the last dance market analysis part two. So, but first, uh, something that we have not done yet on the show, Brian, you, you talked to me about this off the air. We want to have some thoughts about the last dance itself, uh, for members of our audience who have not listened to our five hours worth of, uh, last dance recaps that we recorded and, and you can hear them on the YouTube channel. So let's try, let's just talk about the last dance for a second. So we're almost three weeks removed from the final episode of the last dance. But if does it feel like that long? It feels like it's been longer to me. It feels like you know a whole like epic chapter uh, in sports happened and then it closed and it just I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and I think time's moving a little slower now too, or faster or whatever. So I don't know. It just seems like things are uh, there's a lot going on. So. A lot has happened even since the last day. So I think in that sense, it feels like I want it back, though. Like, I want to be able to rewatch it. And I feel that. content but re-watch, with its run, actually. Like, like I, yeah. I would only want to rewatch it if I could rewatch it again for the first time. Hmm. Hmm. I see. I want to watch it like all the way through, though. Yeah, I want to watch it again eventually too. But like, I'm content I'm not, with the run that it had right now. Like, yeah, I, I got sure. I got enough. You know, yeah. I didn't get too full on the content, but no. I am full. I got enough. Okay, so 
mainstream coverage now has turned back to discussing current sports news and we have new espn documentaries airing right now like the lance armstrong one and there's others on the horizon like the sosa and mcguire one so you also have the fact that now the nba has announced it's returning in late july with some interesting twists such as a potential play-in tournament for the eighth seed there's plenty of material available in other words for the mainstream sports outlets to devour but nonetheless, it definitely was a glorious month-long celebration of MJ, of the Bulls, of 90s basketball in general. But now, much like the storytelling techniques employed in the documentary itself, we sports aficionados and card collectors are jumping forward in time. It's back to the present, albeit with a newfound appreciation for the greatest player, dare I say the greatest athlete of all time. Now, I think of another GOAT, LeBron James, and he had a very interesting take on The Last Dance, and he's the one person that I want to quote on it. So a lot of us were waiting to hear what LeBron thought about the documentary, and he finally spoke up, and his answer was clever. Here's what he said, quote, Me personally, the way I play the game, team first, I feel like my best assets work perfectly with Mike. Mike is an assassin. When it comes to playing the game of basketball, scoring the way he scored the ball, then my ability to pass, my ability to read the game plays in advance. I saw things that Scotty Pippen was able to do with Mike. I just think it would have been a whole nother level. Pip was one of my favorite players. It would have been a whole nother level with me being a point forward alongside him during those Chicago runs. And then LeBron had an interesting tweet as well. He tweeted, Quote, I love the greats and would have loved to play with them all during their runs because I'm a historian of the game, but I also would die to compete versus every single one of them too. Do not get it twisted. Nevertheless, MJ, thank you for being my angel, my inspiration, my superhero. So those are LeBron's thoughts on Jordan and the last dance. Uh, Feel free to react to those if you'd like to. I thought that was an interesting way to approach the subject and sort of diffuse and avoid the elephant question in the room and then you know so i'll open the topic either topic to you you can either react to lebron uh or you can just give your own thoughts on what you thought like just there's maybe one or two resounding thoughts that you have on the last dance as a whole and what it meant to you well real quick on lebron i think LeBron here sees himself as like somebody that's on par with the League of the Goats, um, which he is. So that's why he's talking in this, this kind of conversation. And of course, he wants to kind of play like the fantasy of like, well, if I could have played with like Mike, like we would have killed it. And I'm sure they would have if they would have, you know, but obviously it's not a reality, but it pays credence to what he thinks about, uh, you know, MJ and like saying he's a superhero and stuff is paying credence to the fact that he's recognizing him for like who he is and what he is. So, you know, at the end of the day, it is an interesting response, but he's paying credence in terms of the last dance. Like I, I I mean, it was just so much content and so much content from MJ. Um, I kind of walked away with it as like a more endearing, like, I don't want to say like a relationship with MJ. Cause like, I, you know, but you, you feel like you have a relationship to these people, even though you don't, you know, you obviously have no real ties to them, but you like, it made me kind of motivated and like, it makes me like motivated. I'm like, Oh, if I like, I'm on a run, like, am I going to give up? Like, would MJ give up? And they're like, no, MJ wouldn't give up. So I'm going to keep going. Like it kind of make, it motivates me on that kind of level. So just seeing his tenacity, his competitiveness, I mean, and just his, his focus, his laser beam focus only thing he was concerned about was winning that's it he didn't he didn't he had no other concerns and like to his fault like i'm like there's a lot that probably wasn't discussed but i'm sure there's a lot that he had to deal with with having that kind of laser focus and having that kind of uh just self-sacrifice to every level to win it's just something that's very inspiring but at the same time it's like it's you you feel like emotionally like the like the pain that he kind of felt within all of it too you know especially with dealing with other people and you know a lot of people talk you know crap about him and he has to deal with that and you can obviously see from like an emotional standpoint it does affect him even though he is like somebody that we view as like the goat and like it's still he's still human he's still got like this other side to him so i don't know i thought that was really cool i think that's my wrap up on the last dance so just insp- inspiring, you know, inspiration. Christina? 
I would agree. Uh, I walked away and I would say I do have a better relationship with Michael um, because you could totally have a one way relationship with someone. <laughs> we named a podcast after him. I think we have a, a relationship with him. Correction. We named the podcast after his basketball cards. Okay, we named a podcast after the man's basketball cards, which contain pictures of him, and we call him the goat every episode. So I think that we can have a relationship with him. Anyway. um, Well, he was once uh, photographed in a candid shot, actually listening to this podcast. He had it on yeah. his uh, iPad sitting behind him. Yeah. And, then, and then he has three. He only has yeah. three cards, three PSA graded cards, one of each of us. They're all 10 gem mints. Mm-hmm. And so he listens. So we and- have a we have a. a- a two-way relationship with Michael Jordan. Well, he has a one-way one with us, and we have a one-way one with him. There you go. Okay. okay. Any other I thoughts, stand corrected. Christina, on the last dance? I think I'm just done at this point. All right, good. Now, let's look at the Michael Jordan card market. And I'm sorry, guys. There's no MJ card market report this month. But trust me, it is worth the wait. We've got something so much better coming a little bit later this month. I promise you're not going to be disappointed. All right, so first I want to look at the MJ card market by looking at a handful of cards that I think are representative of the different trends that we've seen in Jordan cards in different segments. And the first card to discuss naturally is his 1986 Fleer PSA 10 rookie card. We saw eight, that's right, eight public sales of this card, his Fleer rookie PSA 10, in May. That's up quite a bit from April, which saw zero sales. The card sold thrice in March. And once in February. So relative to the ordinary transaction volume of this card, six, uh, eight sales is a staggering increase. And in between May 7th and May 21st, um, that window alone, the card sold six times for an average price of $91,409. Then on May 28th, which featured a slightly off-centered PSA 10 that the auction house had comically titled, Looks Like an 11. Ended at $70,000, and then one ended with PWCC a few days later for $71,000. What is the moral of this story? And it's simply this. Transaction volume does matter. This card typically sells two to three times per month, and essentially tripling the transaction volume is sure to drive prices down. The perceived scarcity of the card drops off substantially when eight of the 312 PSA 10 copies sells within a month period. It lets buyers get a little more cautious because they don't feel the need to ramp up their max bid constantly because another one's just going to sell three days later or four days later. So all things considered, this card holding the line at $70,000 is impressive. It was selling at the $40,000 range in January through March of this year. So that's a 75% increase in price on a very high dollar card despite the flood of supply that we've seen here in the last month. So looking back several weeks after the last dance has concluded, it's starting to look like there has been a pretty sustainable boost to the MJ Fleer rookie card market. But of course, the question remains, will more owners of this card look to cash in at 70000 Or would they rather prefer to hold on to the card at that price? My prediction is people are going to choose to hold on because I think a lot of people who have this card, they want to wait and see if it can break $100,000. It got so close, but it didn't do it. However, if another half dozen or so copies, which isn't that many, If another half dozen or so flood the market in June, I predict that this card is going to retreat further. What are your thoughts on the Fleer PSA 10 market at this point in time? I'm just upset that it didn't break 100,000. Yeah. Like, because that's what we kept like saying, like, right? We were like, oh, it's going to be, I mean, Brian got closest. He said 97, 98. Yeah. um, And it was 99, 630. So here's the thing. You need two people willing to bid over $100,000 for a card to break over $100,000. We might have had one person enter a bid over $100,000. But I think it is psychologically significant that that there weren't two people in this world who were willing to bid over $100,000 for it at that time. Because I think that psychological barrier... I, I just don't think the card was quite ready to do it yet. Well, looking at the sales, it's because the sale, the 99,000 sale was on May 20th. There was another, and that was the auction. There was another auction that ended on May 21st. Yep. So why would you? I know. You can always wait for the next one. Exactly. That's the problem when the market gets flooded. 
Exactly. And it's sad when a market floods with cards and we're about to hear of a few more that happen. It's sad because it, ma- it makes me sad because like, why don't you want to keep the card? Why are all of you, you know, six, eight of you, why are you selling this great card right now? Because they have two. Because they have two maybe. or, you know, or they, they have a, they have an eight or a nine or a seven maybe. You know, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I understand there's lots of reasons for people to sell cards. I don't but know. Why are you selling cards? I, it, that's very sad, too. Well, it is. It's it's sad when you sell any card, but this is a. I feel like this is a. This is a grail. I mean, let's be honest. It's a it grail. is. So it's it's not like. It, it's if you you wouldn't sell your PMG red. You no, know, like, this is a different type of grail though. This it is, is this is the type of grail. grail that you have at least two to three chances every month to buy a PMG red. You might get one shot a year to buy a card like that. Or that's less. A, that's a very good point. I was gonna say a lot less. So it's a different type of grail, but it's, it's a grail. It's, it's grail status is purely because of how iconic it is. But I, th- I think like we saw a lot of these copies come to market because of the fact that it reached that kind of threshold of all, nearing 100,000. Right. Yeah. So people sell it. They want to get, you know, the people that sell it, though, they sell it. So like now, now what? Like, are people going to keep on putting it on the market? My guess is the people that wanted to sell it have already sold it. And I think <laughs> that people will continue to hold it. And then I think this card will go over 100000 at one point. I think people are looking at this card and they're seeing it as like a Mickey Mantle rookie. And that's how they're treating it. And they're in it for the long game. Well, that's I my mean, personal opinion. Yeah. We see on May 7th that it sold for $96,000, right? So I think a lot of people were like, okay, like my card might be the one that goes over a hundred. Seven people thought that. Yeah. And it didn't happen. So I think that that psychology is there where they were like, well, if it sold for 96, that means someone who missed out on it might be willing to pay that four extra grand, not knowing six other people were thinking the same thing, therefore flooding the market. All right. Let's talk about another iconic card, the 1993-94 Scoring Kings insert. And we're going to talk about it in two different grades. First, the PSA 10. We saw four copies of the PSA 10 come to market in the last 10 days of May. That is a staggering amount. This card only sold at auction eight times in all of 2019. And we had four of them pop up in 10 days in May. The last time that this card ran at auction prior to those four copies was half a year ago, way back in December of last year, where it clocked in at $1,625. The most recent sale from May 31st clocked in at $4,000. That's an incredible and a seemingly enduring appreciation, despite the fact that this market, by its own uh, relative to, to its normalcy, has also been flooded and it's not far off from this card's peak value $4,700 which was achieved on May 26th but let's be clear this card is no longer on an upward trajectory it's now hanging on at the $4,000 mark nonetheless it's up about 150% over its pre last dance price now the PSA 9 tells a slightly different story the PSA 9 has sold 14 times in the last 30 days. Now you compare that to April when it only sold three times or March when it only sold three times. Okay, so we're starting to see a pattern here as we've now looked at three cards. Sellers decided to start cashing out at the end of the last dance in mid-May and they continued to cash out even after the run completed. So the PSA 9 peaked at $1,800 on April 17th and then it plummeted all the way down to $960 on May 12th And now it has rebounded to $1,400 as of June 3rd. So for comparison's sake, it sold for $875 in mid-March. All right, that's a lot of numbers. But what's the basic pattern that we're seeing here? Well, once again, the market was flooded. However, once again, the price seems to be settling in and now settling in at about the $1,400 range. It's flattening out. So on the whole, this card, like the PSA 10, is up from its pre-last dance price, but this one only about 60%. And it is pulled to about even with its value when the last dance was first announced, which was marked by a $1,400 sale on April 5th of 2020. Let's throw in one more iconic card for good measure, the 97 Mellow Universe PSA 10 base card. This card sold five times in May and six times in April. It only sold once in January, February, and March combined. 
So it is currently holding steady at $2,000 in price. It's up 181% from its pre-Last Dance value of about $700. However, during Last Dance Mania, it recorded three sales at $3,000 or above. And that means that at the current price point, which is about $2,000, it's down 33% from its peak. So not to beat a dead horse here, but once more, we're seeing the effect of sellers flooding the market. And you know the question that I have, of course, um, always seeing the glass is half full. I wonder, what would the MJ card market look like for these particular cards if people didn't flood the market with them? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I think that people... I, th- I think the cards would hold... a. Uh, a more steady price but at the same time like it's just a natural function of like the market dynamics like you see like a card surge and like it just it's like a supply and demand so like people are just gonna they're gonna see the price they're like all right well i'm gonna be able to i'm gonna be able to sell it and then eventually though what happens is eventually those floods will subside and the card price will then, I think, continue to a more trajectory kind of with no flood situation. Because the people that are going to get rid of the card when they're flooding the market are going to get rid of it. But the other people, why wouldn't why would they still be holding the card if they didn't want to, you know, sell it? Indeed. Well, it's always the most important question. And if you had to answer this question, you'd be able to play the market like a fiddle is knowing at what prices people are and how many people are going to be willing to bring their copy to sale. So uh, that is always the eternal question. So I've prepared a couple of instances here of MJ cards that, in fact, did not flood the market. And let's see how they performed relative to cards that did flood the market. So the first one up is the 97 Planet Metal PSA 10 insert. Here are its last three sales, 2500 in February. 2900 on May 18th and 3300 on May 25th. So that's right, it's still climbing, baby, over a week after the last dance concluded. And even this market was slightly flooded relative to how frequently this card sells. So two sales over a span of eight days for this card is atypical, given that it normally sells only a handful of times a year. This card never saw a dramatic spike and then retreat in value, and that's probably because it didn't sell once actually during the airing period of the last dance instead is just steadily climbing compared to its auction value of $739 in last June, which is roughly a year ago. This card is up 350% with no valleys in its beautiful graph. The 1997 high voltage PSA 10 has followed a very similar arc a year ago. It was $1,000. It sold twice in the latter half of May after registering zero sales in all of 2020 prior to that. Those sales clocked in at $2,500 on May 16th and $3,900 on May 27th. So indeed, here is a card that is surging in value after the last dance. Now, Brian, you had floated a very interesting theory about the Michael Jordan high voltage and why there might be something a little extra pushing this card up. Yeah, I mean... It's because of the Hoops high voltage uh, release that they did with Prism this year. I think that that is causing people to kind of look back and like, oh, wow. So there was high voltage with, you know, all these like 90s cards. That's kind of cool. Like, so people are like MJ, obviously, they they see that and they, they want to buy it, you know? Absolutely. And I think here, too, for this card specifically, right, low pop. So that's a natural function in itself of preventing a flood of the market. Also, if you look at the the Metal Universe, that's relatively low pop too, to flooding the market. Compare that to like a you know PSA nines where it's more easily you know it's a higher pop right for like a scoring canes. One thing about the Planet Metal, I'm wondering if people are kind of associating that with like the Prism Silver in a sense because of the way like it has like kind of like refractor, and I don't I don't know I or it's just people like the card i mean i think it's a gorgeous card but interesting that card did take a while is is, that card has lagged traditionally behind the rest of the market but it more than made up that ground very recently (laughs) so i understand why you would posit that perhaps 
there, people are seeing something familiar in it that's allowing this car to experience the rate of growth that it has over the last year. All right, so on a more practical level, listeners of this show, some of you might be saying, well, this is all great, but what if I don't have thousands of dollars right now to just hold and just wait and spend on rare, these tightly held inserts that only show up a few times a year? And I think that's a question a lot of people asked themselves recently when they decided to start collecting MJs. Well, all right, I accept your challenge. Here's one lower end insert that has held up nicely following the last dance, and it's the 1995 Maximum Metal PSA 10. This card sold in the $200 range throughout all of 2019. Then it sold three times in the last three months in March for 356, in April up to 500, and then in May up to $585. Steady incremental growth for this card before, during, and after the last dance. And we see that a key ingredient to a steady appreciation is, once again, it never flooded the market. So, takeaways. In conclusion, well, at the risk of oversimplifying things, here's one lesson that I think we can say we've learned. The iconic cards, and I'm talking the Fleer Rookie, the 93 Scoring Kings, the 97 Metal Universe base card, they all came to market during the heights of Last Dance Mania and set astonishingly high prices which triggered an avalanche of sellers looking to bring theirs to market and cash in as well. These cards are still up substantially over their pre-last dance values, but they sure are down from their last dance peak. However, the rarer cards, like the Planet Metal and the High Voltage and the Maximum Metal inserts, they, they never set astonishing record highs during the last dance. They simply experienced what I would describe as an accelerated rate of growth. It was as if they had what would have normally been 12 months worth of growth for them, but just they condensed it into a month or two, which is impressive and it's noteworthy, but it's not enough of a surge to make owners of these cards just start flooding the market with them. And that seems to be the sweet spot for finding long-term success with cards of a highly collectible player that experiences a sudden and unexpected influx of hobby interest. Cards that are appealing, but that fly under the radar. The cards that true collectors know and hunt you are a lot less likely to lose money buying these types of cards even if you buy them during a moment of massive hype and this is why having hobby knowledge is so essential to thriving long term in this game hardcore mj collectors you all know exactly what i'm talking about right now because when you can see the whole why are you laughing at me right now you like my delivery yes. when you can see the whole <laughs> landscape of michael jordan cards you can readily identify and recognize cards that are in the sweet spot and for good measure here's another lesson we learned if you've got those iconic cards and you're looking to flip them for maximum value do what not what should they do do not wait too long please do not wait too long The iconic cards tend to peak early. For example, the Scoring Kings PSA 9 peaked in mid-April, right around the time when the first episode debuted. So too did the 93-94 Finest Refractor PSA 9, a card which we did not analyze in depth here today, but that followed a very similar trajectory. It surged to to north of $3,500 in mid-April, before plunging all the way down to $2,000 a few days ago. But note, it's still up from its $800 to $1,000 price range pre-last dance. But if you waited until now to flip the card, assuming that you wanted to flip it, you definitely have left a lot of money on the table. But we already knew this from when we studied the Patrick Mahomes Prism Rookie cards, did we not? They peaked the day of the Super Bowl, and then the week after he won Super Bowl MVP, his cards collapsed, losing nearly 50% of their value. But they eventually returned. And now they're more valuable than they ever were just a few months later. Interesting conclusion there. Ah. I'll leave it. That's my comment on that. I think I smell what you're cooking. What's that? Are you saying long hold? You've seen my PC. Yeah, that, that is the name of the MJ game. And that's the way I like it. That's how I enjoy my collection. I want cards that don't give me anxiety when I look at the box and think, oh, man. You know, if this if if he twists his ankle or God forbid whatever else. Oh my God, shut up! All right, <laughs> Man, I'm not talking. About, I didn't say any names. Player X, remember? Player right. X. 
Finally, the final segment of today's show, Mail Days. Mail Days. And who should lead off Mail Days? Brian. Brian. Because Brian okay. brought over Mail Days and he said, I'm not telling you what I have. He said, Brian, Brian, yeah. let, Brian let off Mail Days and he said, I'm not telling you what I have. Uh, do you want me to? And I was like, no. And then he tried to tell me, but I stopped him. So this is going to be a surprise. Well, Christina, well, I'm, I'm buying you time not to start open. opening this, yep. this pack. <laughs> so none of Brian's are open. None of Brian's are open. We I don't, don't even know, know what it is. What's inside. Well, we'll <laughs> yeah, see what comes out first. He doesn't know which ones are which. So That's it's true. going to be interesting. All right. Drum roll. Drum roll I'm please. so excited to see what's in these packs. It's brown cardboard. It's brown cardboard. Gotta love that. I do love the green tape. That's nice. It's well. It's nice when they put some some good packaging to protect the card. I guess you know. I've found packaging techniques to be very good yeah. in the year twenty twenty. Ooh. 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 What do we got here? Is that a um, mosaic Genesis? Yes, it is. Ooh. Who's the player on that, Christina? That is DeLon Wright. DeLon Wright of the Dodo. Mavericks. Mosaic Or is that Genesis. Dorian? Dorian is Dodo. Dodo, okay. DeLon Wright. <laughs> Just kidding. Can't wait to see this guy on the floor in about a month and a half to two months here. Seriously. Oh, man. I, You know, I wanted to really see this card and see it in hand, you know? And you haven't yet. Cause I haven't. But I'm, I'm looking at Christina. I mean, that, that's... This is why I have it set up that the... Uh, there, there's now a screen in the studio well, so everyone can Christina, enjoy what it. is this? How does this card present in hand? It's gorgeous. I'm really enjoying the refractor finish on it. Um, the It's kind of like waves going beyond the geometric shape, like in the background. Um, it, it just it looks gorgeous. It I, does look gorgeous, and it has the Mavericks team colors. I haven't seen mm-hmm. it before in hand, obviously. I right, pass it um, to me before it gets sucked down the black hole, of Brian, because he's <laughs> never going to let it go. Once, ooh, wee, this is nice. This is this is much nicer in hand than than it looks in pictures. All right, so we have another. That's why one. I wanted to get it because I really wanted to see, you know, because mosaic in general, it's it's really hard to capture in a picture, so those are nice. Very All nice. right, one we're, and time. we're on to package number two of three. One more time. It's oh, like yeah, smoky it waves. Like, it's just gorgeous. Yeah, hold, it yeah, hold it down towards you more a little bit. There, oh, there you go. The problem is, like, it's getting my okay. next shirt card. That's more than it's getting the designs of the card. All right, next card. Was that the card that you were talking about? That you were Whoa. teasing us with? Yeah, it was. Okay. Nice, that's a sweet Of card. course it's the first one I opened. I like that. I, right. I really On enjoyed to that. Package number two. It's a beautiful card. More nice packaging with cardboard yeah. included. Putting some time into it. And what do we have here? Luca! Luca, Luca Mosaic. What is it? This is the white parallel. I've heard about these, right? Is that what this is? This is just the base. Oh, this is just the is base. Is it called? Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, it's just a straight up base. Okay. So. This is also a really cool card. Oh, it's just because the light was so bright on yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. The Luca base okay, from 2019 20 Mosaic. Figure out how much does a card lighting. like this run? So, this card, I you know, I, I don't remember exactly what I paid for it, but it was probably like two bucks or something. I paid more for it in shipping than I paid for the card. <laughs> um, so, nice. <laughs> that's okay. kind of the that's the move I made for this one. I, I've seen the, uh, the silvers for these. Have been going for pretty pretty high prices. I really like. like, like There's something. silvers that, and mosaic parallels. Yes, they are the city jerseys. Mm. I'm a fan That's of that point. on Luca. Is, I don't think I don't know if yeah, his isn't. So two no. of Brian's three. So right is not a city days. jersey, but Luca is the city jersey. Our mosaic. Well, you know the city yeah, jersey got a lot of hangs flack behind me. Uh, I from like Mavericks it. Fans, yeah. but I like it too. I also really enjoy the front of the city jersey, and I debated whether I should show the front or the back. Of Maybe you'll switch after a few episodes. I think it might, or we have to get a second one so that it could be both. All right, when what is in package three? I already saw Brian's the, mail that. Well, we didn't. It it said what it is on the top. So. Oh, jeez. Okay. Well, don't spoil so it. Knows. All 
And the card is if Christina, unopenable. Yeah, can get the package open. More cardboard and safe packaging. Luca, Ooh, what do we have here. Luca. Luca. What what card is this? The base of Luca. Another base. Yeah, another base of mosaic yeah. Luca. Okay, we've been over this card. Nice card. All right. Nice now, card. Now we Christina's have Christina's mail day. A mail day for me. And this mail day, while Christina this, opens it, yeah, I'll, I'll throw ahead. in a little bit of it. Uh, one of Christina's very first guests on Christina's Corner was the infamous card killer. I'm Social media. The, I'm knocking the like the, the fourth Sorry, wall is and, completely uh, the, down. The fourth wall has been broken, but we <laughs> literally don't break. just caught. We like, bend, we don't break. Okay, all right. Card killer. We'll cut that out. It uh, was one of Christina's very first. Uh, interviewees. He gave a really great, interesting interview. He demonstrated some of his card creating techniques. He has awesome videos <laughs> on his Instagram page. Extremely creative fellow, and also it turns out an extremely generous fellow. And Amazingly what generous, Mister Card Killer himself. Sent to Christina for the House of Jordans podcast. What is it? He sent the very is first killed. Michael Jordan card. The first wow. MJ kill by card killer, and it is. This is the here um, with it's us. autoed on the back, That's which is awesome. sick. Really sweet. Um, this is the ten year anniversary uh, gold of nice. the uh, eighty six flare. Very cool. This looks, looks beautiful, dope. man. It really blings. Yeah. Oh, this is such an amazing card. I am so Let excited. Let me take a look at that thing. And while I, I look think at it, so. I think that this I, come on because otherwise I'm never going to get to see it. I have to look at it now. You're going to take it away. <sighs> all right, hey guys, sending wow. some love your way. Thanks again for all that you are doing for art in the hobby. Figure this banger needs to be where it belongs, a little rough around the edges, but who better to have this beta version than you, the House of Jordans? Enjoy it any way you see fit. Kisses, card killer. I love this card. I that card is mine. This so card backup looks boy. awesome. <laughs> wow. I'm gonna have to build a shelf behind me just to keep it on my studio wall and not his. <laughs> this is really, really. I love how visual art and cards have become such a thing. Uh, all right, let's do the final mail day. This is one half of our BGS mail day. We had a two-card mail day come in this week. This card is the 2019-20 Panini Origins Luca base card, but it's the parallel. It's the black one-of-one one parallel. It graded a BGS 8.5 uh, because the corners um, in particular uh, received an 8. The corners were pretty tough. Love this card as well. The holofoil on the name plate and uh on the one of one and on the origins logo at the top is really nice great picture of luca in action making a pass i love when they highlight the fact that he passes uh and you know you can never have too many luca one-on-ones in the pc so <laughs> that's for sure this one looks sweet too i really like the uh the front of it and just the colors with the black and the blue and the beautiful card so yeah. christina to bring us on home this is the very last part of this episode would you please give us an art house. Critique. Of course. So this 2019-20 Panini Origins, which I'm a huge fan of, this is the black uh, parallel, the one of one, as Chris said. It's number 55 of the set, Luka Doncic. At the top, we see Origins, but what's great about the logo of this is that the smoke is actually like blending in. Uh, so it's covering the bottom part of origins and you see that at the bottom of the o and the um n and the s i really like that that the smoke is 3d on the card and it's not just origin stamped on top of the card itself it's playing with the design uh in a way that is very sophisticated like Brian said, the blue and the black of the jersey and the blue background really make the card pop. Um, Luca is in his all blue uniform, including blue tights, uh, leg warmers, whatever you want to call them, and blue socks. Uh, <laughs> and you in see his tutu. him. Yeah. <laughs> And you see him passing uh, in mid pass, and you could just imagine that 
uh, that is going to like Maxi or Porzingis and it's going to score. So I would love to see uh, Card Insights do this card uh, eventually. No pressure, guys. <laughs> Total pressure, guys. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but I really enjoy this card. So we have... Hey, well, this of- card would be very hard to photo source. He's just making a pass. You yeah, can't see any players in the background. The only this thing, could be from any game. The thing is, well, I guess any game that they wore that the jersey. Thing, yeah, the thing is that um, we know it's his rookie year, so it's going to be early on. When did this product come out? Oh, 1920. Yeah, I don't know when it came out in the season. If it could have had action it came shots, came out pretty early. I think it did too. It so yeah, you're probably it. right. This probably is like a rookie. Yeah, it did come out early. It yeah. came out. Yeah. Um, but it potentially it could be the beginning half of the season. Um, one thing going for us this year is that the season's cut short, so it'll be easier for uh, RC and KC to <laughs> find games of. That's called pictures. finding the silver lining. That's finding the silver lining. The stars in the background. Let's get back to the art house critique or critique of this. The stars in the background of this card make it seem like he is um, kind of like a constellation in the sky. So, um, yeah. like very Greek mythology esque or Roman mythology, depending on, uh, like I think it's Roman. I love the uh, the space cards. Yes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if only there was like ghost trailing Lucas. Yeah. <laughs> this would be it. Would be complete. It would be, perfect, it would yeah. be Brian's perfect be card. card ever. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I really enjoy this card. Like I said, uh, your eye is drawn straight to the center because that's where Luke is placed. He's, he's obviously in motion and the smoke behind him is also in motion. It gives the whole card a feel of movement that you um, enjoy, that is enjoyable to the eye. Luka Doncic, Dallas Mavericks is down at the bottom, also in that silver foil that Origins is in. And then right between his feet is the one of one stamp very very and nice. it's written out one of one which yes. i always enjoy more than the one slash one absolutely yeah i agree absolutely all right well that will do it for house of jordan's episode 32 uh thank you for tuning in as always stay tuned this june um there is a lot of interesting content come from come out from us and i'm not just talking about conversations with chris uh or christina's corner there's even more and it's pretty exciting teaser it's gonna be an exciting couple months can't wait for uh basketball to come back but in the meantime we got the hobby so you might be fun you might actually by the time you watch this have some kind of insight into what we are referring to Yep, but maybe yep. not listen if it's if it's the midnight uh, Thursday <laughs> night crowd. Yes, you'll be confused. That's all right. Confusion. Well, I'm confused. The- <laughs> That's okay. We I'm don't want to get to confusing ourselves. Stay tuned. We have a lot of exciting things coming up for you this summer, including Christina's Corner, cr- conversations with Chris, and a lot of content. We just steal uh, my line and now. And perhaps But you, you stole my line, but else. you put your show before mine. Because my show was first, and someone is copying my lane. I just want to have my your own Your corner, show you mean? Look, you have a corner, <laughs> and I have conversations. <laughs> Yeah, I have I, video. Mine's better. I have conversations. You do have conversations. What what's Brian's show going to be called? Brainstorming with Brian. I've already with decided. Brian. <laughs> I, I already was thinking like I was thinking more like balling with Brian. Balling with Brian. That works. That could work. I don't know. I'll think about this offline. One of those might work though. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. That we gotta keep do the it. alliteration going. Yes, though. we do. That's episode thirty two. See you guys for episode thirty three next week. Scotty Pippen's number. Take it easy.